Hello everyone and welcome to the Adrenal and Endocrine High Yield Video Information which is a resume inspired from the chapter of Adrenal and the Endocrine System in the Living Surgery for the textbook written by Dr. Gonzalez Escola. I am a medical student at the University of Montreal. My name is Lorena Alexandra Mesha and I am the student who prepared this presentation. Here is, first of all, some general information about the adrenal and endocrine system. First of all, let's go over the anatomy. As for the cortex, 80% of the adrenal gland is the cortex and it is composed by three main layers. The zona glomerulosa, which is the outer layer, the zona fasciculata, which is the middle layer, and the zona reticularis, which is the inner layer. The medulla is composed of autonomic nerve fibers and PNMT is an enzyme present in the medulla, which is responsible for the conversion of norepinephrine to epinephrine. If we go over the arterial supply, we have the renal artery, the juxtaceliac aorta, and the inferior phrenic artery. But the venous drainage is single. The left adrenal vein drains into the left renal vein, whereas the right adrenal vein drains directly in the vena cava. Here is the adrenal medulla, if you need to remember its components. And these are the areas we have discussed. And yes, the uh, glands are covered by a capsule. Here is the transformation of norepinephrine into epinephrine. And this is the enzyme we discussed. As for the adrenal cortex hormones, you need to know that cholesterol is transformed into aldosterone, cortisol, and androstenedione. But no sex steroids can be synthesized in the zona glomerulosa since an enzyme is missing. Steroids and thyroid hormone bind to intracellular receptor, whereas peptide binds to cellular receptors. This is something important to remember. And if we go over the HPA axis, we need to know that the hypothalamus releases CRH, which causes the secretion of ACTH. It leads, finally, to the secretion of cortisol in the zona glomerulosa, and usually the peak of glucocorticoids are 30 minutes after awakening. Cortisol induces a catabolic response, including immunosuppression, among many. As you can see, the transformation is very complex, but we touched on uh, the main tr uh, element being transformed, which is cholesterol, which turns into these three that we mentioned. Here is the HPA axis, in case you do not remember it. As for the mineral corticoids found in the zona glomerulosa, the primary one is aldosterone and its secretion will depend on angiotensin II, blood volumes and potassium levels. It regulates fluid and balances electrolytes. It is secreted in the distal convoluted tube. Angiotensinogen with renin gives angiotensin one. Angiotensin one with enzymes which are usually found in the lungs, will give what we call angiotensin II, which is a vasoconstrictor, and it enhances aldosterone secretion, which is our main mineral corticoid. And aldosterone will create sodium channels in the distal tube. As for adrenal sex steroids, what you need to know is that they are regulated by ACTH, which we saw in the HPA axis, and adrenal androgens will include androstenedione, which we saw earlier, DHEA, as well as DHEAS, which are weaker androgens compared to the other we saw before. For females, testosterone is synthesized by these weaker androgens, which enhances axillary, pubic hair growth, and libido. Here is a transformation and all the elements that we discussed, which eventually will give you the angiotensin II receptors, which enhances aldosterone secretion. Here are some medical conditions. First of all, you need to know about primary adrenal insufficiency, which is a chronic condition. Main symptoms are adrenal dysfunction, weakness, nausea and vomiting, hyperpigmentation, hypotension, and hyponatremia and hyperkalemia. Often etiologies will include 
and adrenal gland destruction, mainly by tumors and a severe septicemia, especially in pediatrics or asplenic patients, which can lead to Waterhouse Frenchian syndrome. Now let's go over primary hyperaldosteronism, which is known as Kahn's syndrome. It is a condition with high aldosterone production, usually found at mid age 50, which increases the risk of cardiac events or disease. Symptoms are hypertension, classically diastolic pressure, and the possible hypokalemia. Etiologies will be, in 70% of cases, bilateral adrenal hyperplasia and unilateral aldosteronoma. The diagnosis will include aldosterone levels of over 15 as well as aldosterone to renin ratio of over 30. After the diagnosis, you will need to do a CT scan and possibly an adrenal venous sampling to find the lesion. Now, after you diagnose, you will need to do a salt loading workup and the final treatment would be in case of a non-lateralizing bilateral hyperplasia, you will give spironolactone, but if it is a lateralizing aldosterone adenoma, you will need to do an adrenalectomy. Now, let's go over Cushing's syndrome, which is basically high cholesterol levels. The symptoms are and signs are usually truncal obesity, osteoporosis, hypertension in 70% of cases, hyperglycemia, and many others, including stray, depression, hirsutism, a buffalo's hump, which I will show you a picture afterwards, and cardiovascular complications. For the etiologies, number one is glucocorticoids intake, which include the inhaled ones, and another one in Cushing's uh, patients is a um, tumor found in the pituitary who um, increases the secretion of ECTH. You have to do two out of four of these tests before posing a diagnosis. First of all is a urine cortisol test, which can be done in 24 hours. You can also do a bedtime salivary cortisol and a bedtime serum cortisol level analysis. You can also do a low dose of dexamethasone and then analyze serum cortisol. The workup afterwards would be to search the cause and obtain plasma ACTH levels. If the levels are high, you should do a brain MRI and have a high dose of dexamethasone test. But if it is not a pituitary tumor, as the brain MRI would suggest, you should do a CT of the chest and abdomen and pelvis. There might be an ACTH secreting tumors, which is often found in the lungs in this case. If levels are normal, you should do a CT of the chest and pelvis for adrenal adenomas or bilateral hyperplasia, which could be secreting cortisol. As for the treatment, if it is a pituitary tumor, you should do a transphenoidal resection, and if it is an adrenal tumor, you should do an adrenalectomy. If it is a bilateral hyperplasia, you should use beta blockers or GnRH antagonists, but if it persists, you should consider uh, removing both adrenal glands. This is the hump uh, that is a classic sign of Cushing's that I mentioned earlier. Another condition is sex steroids tumor, which usually are, they are virilizing and 30% of virilizing tumors are malignant, but most feminizing tumors are malignant as well. The diagnosis includes a urine test of testosterone and DHEE and DHEAS. If it is benign, the treatment will include a laparoscopic adrenalectomy, but otherwise, you should do an open adrenalectomy. Adrenal incidentaloma is an asymptomatic mass that is over one centimeter found by non-related imaging. Usually, there are mal malignant if the patient has a history of a lung malignancy. You should do some images and if the CT enhanced shows a mass that is over 10 Hounsfeld units, this represents a high risk of malignancy and you should do a PET and MRI scan to recommend it. Um, signs you should look for as well are masses over 4 centimeters and high intensity on T2 MRIs.
As for the workup, you should rule out any functional lesions, which we discussed aldosteronoma, Cushing's, and we'll also go over pheochromocytomas. And you should do a CT guided FNA only for tumors that are likely metastatic. The treatment includes a surgical resection if it is a hormonally active tumor or it has any suspicious features, but if it is borderline, you should do six months follow-up. As for glucogonoma, alpha cells are usually over-secreting and 50% of them are metastatic at diagnosis. The symptoms include diabet diabetes mellitus, anemia, thromboembolism in 30% of cases, diarrhea, necrolytic microri edema, which I will show an image later. The diagnosis will include high glucagon levels and biopsy, which is helped by a CT scan, and the treatment will include surgical resection, somatostatin and amino acids for the edema. First, I wanted to show you what a 10 Hounsfield unit looks like, and here is the edema you should look out for, which would be a sign of gonoma. The other medical condition I wanted to touch on is pheochromocytomas. The tumors start usually at the medulla and the mean age at which they're found is 45. In 20% of cases it is familial and in 20% they are malignant. The symptoms are known as a triad, which is headaches, diaphoresis, palpitations, and in 90% of cases you will also find hypertension. In patients with men type 2, Von Hippel-Lindau syndrome, VHL, they are at increased risk of pheochromocytomas. The diagnosis will include a 24-hour urine collection of catecholamines and a plasma level analysis of norepinephrine and epinephrine. The malignancy is diagnosed if the spread is distant. To find its localization, you need to do SCT and MRI, which are the best options, but you can also do an MIBG, which is an analog to norepinephrine, but usually the PET or the CT scan, which have a component of 18F-DOPA, is much better than an MIBG, but it is an option to consider. Pre-op management includes uh, treating the most common issues, that can be found within these patients, which are intraoperative hypertension. In this case, you would first need to use alpha blockage and beta blockers. As for pre-op management, you would need to treat the most common issues, one of them being intraoperative hypertension. You should use alpha blockers, but then you should follow up with beta blockers if a tachycardia follows the alpha blockers. You should always give alpha blockers first. You should also be aware that post-op hypertension may be a problem that you have to solve. As for the treatment, surgical resection is the best, but you need to avoid manipulating the tumor to limit the release of catecholamines and to make sure that the veins are ligated so that the, the, the catecholamines don't spread in the body. And you need to remove the, as much as possible of the tumor. Intraoperative hypertension crisis is possible, but in that case, you need to give nitroprusid. And in cases of familial pheochromocytomas, if it is unilateral, you should do an unilateral adrenalectomy. If it is bilateral with patients with men type 2, you should, give, you should do a bilateral adrenalectomy. And in bilateral patients with VHL, you should do a bilateral cortical sparing adrenalectomy. Insulinoma is an insulin secreting tumor which is found most commonly in insulate cells, but 90% of them are benign and they are associated with men type 1 um, disease. The survival is good even though the tumor might be metastatic. Symptoms are known as Whipple's triad and include hypoglycemia under 55, symptoms of hypoglycemia, mainly confusion and tachycardia, and symptoms usually improve after glucose administration. Diagnosis includes a high serum insulin level analysis during hypoglycemia and a C-peptide and pro-insulin level, which would be elevated, except in patients with Munchen syndrome. 
localization uh, to find out where the tumor is you should do a ct first then followed by an aus and possibly a venous catheterization and insulin sampling and also an intraoperative ultrasound can be considered as for the treatment you should do a surgical resection but if it if it is impossible you should do but if it is impossible you should offer diazooxide which helps with the symptoms Let's go over gastronoma, which is also known as Zollinger-Ellison syndrome, ZES. 20% of ZES are linked to patients with men type 1, so you should rule out men type 1 when analyzing a ZES patient, and it is commonly found in pancreas and afterwards duodenum. Over 60% of these tumors are malignant, and most of them are found in the gastronoma triangle, which I will show later. Etiologies include pernicious anemia, atrophic gastritis, short gut syndrome, renal failure, proton pump inhibitors, and post-vagotomy. Symptoms will include peptic ulcer disease, which may have bleeding or perforations, hypergastrinemia, and recurrent gastric ulcers. The diagnosis includes serum gastrin over 110, a low pH and a secretin stimulation test can be done for diagnosis as well. As for localization, you should do a CT first, followed by an octrotide scan, but you may need to open the duodenum because the lesions are usually very small. Treatment includes surgical rese resection if you want best results, but if it is impossible, OMA prazole is good for symptoms, but even a partial resection would be a good option. Here is a gastronoma triangle we mentioned. Somatostatinoma is a tumor of the D cells which secretes somatostatin. 75% of them are metastatic at diagnosis. Symptoms include abdominal pain, a classic triad of cholelithiasis, di diabetes, and steatorrhea. The diagnosis is done with high plasma somatostatin levels followed by a CT scan to find the tumor. The treatment includes a full surgical resection and octreotides could also be given for symptoms. Let's go over multiple endocrine neoplasia, which is the men um, disease we've been mentioning uh, throughout this presentation. Men syndromes are autosomal dominant conditions associated with endocrine tumors. You can find three types, men one, type one, type 2a, type 2b. You must rule out men syndromes in patients with family members with men syndrome. MEN1, which is known as Vermeer syndrome, is a tumor suppressor gene defect in chromosome 11, which produces menin. It is associated with pituitary tumors, parathyroid hyperplasia, and pancre pancreatic islet tumors. Symptoms are usually hypercalcemia and most commonly gastrinoma, but insulinoma is possible in this case. For men type 2a, which is Sipple syndrome, it is often presented as a defect red, in the red proto-oncogen uh, gene in chromosome 10. It is associated with medullary thyroid cancer, which is associated with high calcitonin levels, it is also associated with pheochromocytomas, which is also associated with high catecholamines levels. And men type 2a is also associated with hyperparathyroidism, which for this case, it is recommended to do an excision of the four glands, but it is a complex procedure because it is also recommended to reimplant half of a gland in the forearm. Men type 2b have a similar defect um, in its genes, um, which would be red proto-oncogen found in chromosome 10, and it is associated with mucosal neuromas, uh, also associated with medullary thyroid cancer. You will also find marfanoid habitus as well as bilateral pheochromocytomas. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope this was helpful.